Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest this week is Dr. Mary Ellen Harris. She is the Chief Human Resources Officer at Kreischer Miller, a 250-person business advisory, accounting, and tax firm serving the greater Philadelphia and Lehigh Valley areas, and they've consistently been recognized year after year as one of the top places to work since 2003. Mary Ellen earned her PhD in leadership in 2015, focusing on, on identifying effective leadership strategies for mitigating bullying in the workplace. And she's been recognized as one of the Titan Top 100 C-level executives in the greater Philadelphia region for the past two years in a row. Mary Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Tell us your fun fact. I think a uh, fun fact I would think about is this I make learning resolutions instead of New Year's resolutions. Hmm, okay. Tell me about I, that. I'd like to choose something new every year to learn and make that my focus for the year. And my favorite recent ones would be I learned American Sign Language. I took piano lessons as an adult. And I took ice skating lessons, which I was an adult and the rest of the class were 12-year-old girls. <laughs> That's awesome. Tell me you were not the only one who was also in a cast at some point. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No broken bones, lots Good. of bruised body parts, but no broken bones. Maybe a little bruised ego here and there, but it sounds like it was fun. It really was fun. It was quite delightful. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. So we've got uh, piano, we've got uh, ice skating. And what was the other one? American Sign Language. Sign Language. Sign Language. That's amazing. So every year you pick one and that's your your focus for the year. Yes. I love it. So it's not a New Year's resolution. It's a learning resolution. Yes. I'm going to tack that on as a as a 24-hour influence challenge of some sort later on. Love it. So <laughs> now tell us a little bit more about Kreischer Miller. What's your 30-second elevator pitch? So I have the privilege of helping our people along their professional journeys. And I get to do that by serving as the chief HR officer here at Kreischer Miller. In, in addition, I have the privilege of helping MBA students in my role as an adjunct professor at Eastern University. And I love it. I get to teach courses on things like leadership theory and strategic change. And my favorite course is business ethics. Business ethics. And is that something that the students find exciting? Is it something they find to, they what, what is it. the energy? Really, they, tell me what they love best. They love the best because it's an opportunity to really talk about things that, frankly, people are polarized about, right? So we mm. put together real life examples of things that are going on business in today's world, and they get to debate it, and they get to play the decision maker, they get to play the leader and say, this is what I would do, or this is how I would handle it. And they debate, and it's wonderful to watch them and interact. That sounds exciting. So you really have to create a safe space there for people to yes. be able to explore the, but what about this? And what about that? And the devil's advocate and the, you know, all those challenges and not feel like you're going to get called to the principal's office for it. Yeah. And keeping it just respectful, right? Yes. It's just respectful that everyone gets to have their opinion and their viewpoint on it. And there's, there's a, a safe place to share each person's feelings and emotions and positions on the topics. And it really resulted in some wonderful, wonderful dialogues. That sounds amazing. If, if only more corporations could create that kind of a safe space for open <laughs> dialogue and discourse and safety as well. Uh, now, what is something you wish that more people understood either about your role, your company, or your industry? And what's your personal role in changing that perception? I would definitely say that the thing I wish that uh, and I try to help influence are the misconceptions about the HR function. Hmm. Um, oftentimes, HR is viewed as the bad people, right? They're the mm. negative. They're the people who fire people. There are the people who discipline people or worse yet, they're the people who treat people like numbers. Mm. And so I really do take that on as my own personal mission, if you will, to change that perception. I try very hard to treat people like humans. And I think, you know, one of the things that's important for us here that we do, and I'm, I'm proud of it, is that... Uh, very, very practically speaking, instead of putting people on performance improvement plans or issuing those final written warning letters to mm. people, which everyone dreads, is we we sort of flip that paradigm, if you will. And we shifted to having respectful conversations with people. And we engage with them and ask them, you know, how do they feel they're doing? What, you know, what do they think they could do better? 
what tools do they need? What skills do they want to work on? And really engage with them in an interactive dialogue to really co-create a document we call a pathway to success. Mm. So you see, we shift that paradigm from, you know, final written warning to here's the pathway to success and define what success looks like for them. And I have a really, a recent, very recent example of this. Please. Um, We had a a young man who was really struggling with the quality of his work. He was making a lot of mistakes. And um, so I just approached him and just said, how are you doing? Like, talk to me about how you're feeling about your work. And he shared with me that he um, loses focus very quickly. Mm. And his seat happened to be right on the aisle that was very high traffic. So every time someone walked past, he would lose his focus. And then he would, he would go back. He, you can imagine how that would create more errors. So I said to him, well, what would help? He said, well, could I change my seat? Easy, easy solution. Absolutely. We changed his seat within a week. You noticed a difference. The quality wow. of his work went up. His ability to focus was better. Now he is ecstatic. He feels good about himself. And he feels good about the company that we didn't put him on any warning. We just changed, we just asked him what would help him. And, and it was really remarkable. And but I but I can't do it alone. So yes, I think yes. one of the other things I wanted to share as I was just thinking of that example was that what was more important was that we've also trained all of the people who are in people manager roles. Okay. Treat people and engage in this interactive dialogue versus discipline, discipline, discipline. Yes. That's been the game changer is that our people managers now feel equipped to say, to approach an employee and say, Hey, I see you're struggling. Let's talk about it. And it's just really reduced the fear element, which has really helped a lot. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of our team members because they've embraced this new quote model, if you will. Sure. And it's really making a difference for people. They feel safe. They feel like it's okay to talk about what I need. It's okay to say, I'm struggling with my quality. And uh, so it's, I, I really think it's really helped a lot. That's terrific. And in in scaling this and making it more part of the corporate culture, the corporate norms and expectations, pro- protocols and things, do you, are you providing those leaders with some of the language, with some ways to approach it? Because I feel like a lot of times people don't give constructive feedback because they don't know how to do it in a way that feels emotionally safe. They don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. They don't want to, the the leader may not want to get quote unquote written up with an HR complaint for having been insensitive about something or, you know, there's, there's so much risk involved in losing face. How are you helping give leaders the tools to be able to initiate those safe space conversations. Yeah. Well, we've done a lot in the fact in the fact the last 12 months, we've doubled down our efforts on that in in that we've provided them with training classes where they get to do role plays mm. and they get to then practice out a conversation and say, oh, you know, I have this one, you know, team member who's struggling in this area. Can I do a mock dialogue with you. And then the other person kind of gives them feedback. Oh, well, maybe if you worded it this way or change the wording. And then we've also done, we do training every other month for our people managers to equip them with dialogues. We've bought them books. The Coaching Habit is the most recent one we bought for them. It's a great book. It's very prescriptive. Um, We've also just asked them to you come into my office and dialogue, you know, do a role play with me one-on-one before they approach the employee so that they feel good knowing that they can do practice sessions beforehand. It makes such a difference. You know, I've always said that the the biggest gap in the world is the three inches between our brains and our mouths. <laughs> it doesn't... <laughs> You know, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a gap. And conceptually, we know we're supposed to do X. We know we're supposed to be diplomatic. We know we're supposed to be sensitive and inclusive. We know we're supposed to be encouraging and facilitative and you know, fill in the blank. But then we open our mouth and what comes out? And we just wish we could reel it all back in and we get that. that. I know it can come out better than that, but you, you can't. You can't unsay it once it's right. there. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, as they like to say. So, you know, to be able to have that opportunity to just dry run something, to test it out, and and uh, you know, make allow that laboratory to be where you identify the 
clearest example of absolutely what not to say. <laughs> Get that out of the way first. That's what the rough draft is for. So you're at least clear on, all right, been there, done that, tried that, note to self, yeah, say something else. <laughs> now let's figure out what that something else is, but at least you're super clear on a direction you don't want to go. And sometimes that's the, the most encouraging feeling is just knowing that that you're very clear on what to avoid, if not what to say itself. So I love that that laboratory space mm -hmm. that yeah. people have to go and play with and, and the tools that are involved as well. Did you ever think though, in, in that example, did you ever think that you did a good job of explaining something only to have the other person look at you like a deer in the headlights? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. What happened there? <laughs> that has happened to me actually several times. I think the mm, the most recent example I can think of was this summer I was teaching a course at uh, my leadership theory course at Eastern. Uh, and the concept that I was talking about was a concept called pseudo transformational leadership. Okay. And I was explaining what pseudo transformational leadership was. And I provided some examples of historical leaders who've been classified as such. Immediately, I observed two students react very strongly to what I was saying. And how did, what did you observe? What was the strong reaction? So the one student, their body language absolutely indicated they were confused. Their okay. facial expression made it clear. Their, their head was tilted. Their forehead was wrinkled. Their eyes were squinting. Mm. And I was like, okay, I lost them. I immediately, mm. the cue was, Marilyn, you lost that one. Yep. Conversely, there was another student who they were very angry. Interesting. Their arms were folded. They pushed back from the desk. They, um, it was very evident that I had upset them. Hmm. And so I, like, it was like, woo, you know, stop sign, right? Immediately I knew, okay, I have to pivot here. Immediately I addressed the angry student's body language. I said, I'm very sorry. Clearly I have upset you. And it was because of the examples of pseudo transformational leadership that are most commonly referred to mm. are Hitler and Osama bin Laden. And okay. those two historical fig figures have very um, deep impact for people emotionally. Yeah. And so I apologized that it was upsetting to the student. And I, I explained why those were examples were given to demonstrate what a pseudo transformational leadership leader was. Mm -hmm. And that the student seemed to accept that and said, okay, you know, and shared a personal story of, of why, you know, the, those two names were very hurtful to that person. And we had a very healthy, respectful dialogue about that. And then in terms of the student who was confused, I then also opened up the dialogue to say, tell me your questions. Let's talk about your questions and mm -hmm. really went to a deep dive. So I think what I learned from that was to really not be cavalier with the examples that I choose mm -hmm. when I'm teaching and also to really stay in tuned and really read the body language of the students. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's funny how especially when you're talking about those heated topics in one way, shape, or, or even not, frankly, but to use an example that where the example itself is polarizing or is triggering or is very emotionally charged in one way, shape, or form, even if you're not, uh, you know, if you're using it as an example of something else. So I mean, I have had conversations where uh, I did a LinkedIn live a little while ago with, and the guest on the show, you know, we had, I don't remember, a few dozen, 30, 40, 50 people on the call at some point. And the person referenced uh, in total light, random, except like it was a comment along the lines of, you know, say you and somebody else were going to talk about in the topic, she referenced gun control. And it was, that's all she said about it. And then it was about addressing someone whose opinion was different from yours. She went into no specifics. She went into no examples. It was not a political conversation. It was not whatever. Instantly, six people dropped off. All she had to do was say the word and six people dropped off. Now, I'm hoping that I didn't just lose people in sharing that example on this podcast episode, but I think people who are listening are, are looking for something different here. But it was just, it's amazing how if people don't understand what you're trying to do with that example and the direction you're going for it, I've done same thing with uh, analyses of different 
political leaders, presidential candidates, and their debating styles. That's all just looking at debate styles. This was effective. This wasn't not whether or not I'd vote for them, not whether or not I think they're a good person, but right. I've had people you know, write to me and say, I can't believe you said anything good about this person. I'm never looking at anything else that you write again. Wow. Oh, okay. You totally missed the point of what I was going for here, but there's yeah. such an emotional charge to that person's name that they just couldn't. Yeah. It was like saying Voldemort in the middle of a Harry Potter movie. Like you just, you're not allowed to say the name. That's right. all there is to it. So yes. nevertheless, okay. Then what about a time when you've allowed yourself to be emotionally vulnerable with your team? How did that impact your relationship with them moving forward? Oh, well, I would say most recently um, in September, 2020, I had to have uh, an emergency brain surgery. Oh, that's not a root canal. Exactly. Yeah, no, no, pretty big deal. Yes. Um, it was thankfully benign tumor. Everything turned out very well. And thanks to the amazing surgeons at Penn, I was able to walk out of the hospital five days later, which amazing. is a miracle. And fortunately, there's been no impact to my brain function. Incredible. However, a minor result of that procedure and that episode, if you will, uh, was that one of my eyes involuntary closes when I speak. Mm. And you might notice it actually even on this podcast. And I shared it with you even before that I, I'm a bit self-conscious about it yeah. and insecure. And it it can be uncomfortable for me, but it's also uncomfortable for and confusing for people when I'm speaking with them. So realizing this, I have learned that I need to speak up and be vulnerable, open up with people. I talk about it so that I can put them at ease and let them know that it's okay to ask me questions. Um, and, and, and people have reacted really positively to it. Some people have thanked me for sharing and said, yeah, I was wondering, but didn't know how to approach it. Others have um, asked me personal questions about the thing I traversed and uh, having some personal relation, you know, in their own personal lives to relate to that matter, whether it was a family member or, or themselves. And actually a one funny thing was one gentleman even thought, said that I, he just thought I was winking at him because he's so funny. <laughs> and you just want to look at him and go, honey, don't flatter yourself. <laughs> and I was like, no, not really. But we laughed about it. He's a sure. great guy. And, uh, and he was just so funny. He's like, I just thought you were winking at me. It was really sweet. Uh <laughs> Maybe it was wishful thinking on his part. Right, right. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but I think what was profound for me was that being vulnerable, I realized that people really appreciate that. And it really makes you more human and frankly, more approachable. And it really deepened some of the relationships that I had with people as a result of that, that they felt now that they can open up with me. And so it's kind of been a really positive result in terms of deepening those professional relationships. And um, so I'm glad now, again, you, I had to just get past my own insecurity about it. Sure. Well, and I think that it's such an important example of of leadership in a way that is typically overlooked because to be able to come in and say you know here's what's happened i want you to understand this it if we don't and if we if you didn't bring that up here on the show and we didn't allow people to to see it in the video if i decided not to run a video version of this one or something to protect quote unquote <clears throat> to for from having to discuss those kinds of topics then the message that that sends is that we need to sanitize the the perspective that anything that looks different anything that is unusual should be hidden and unless it seems quote unquote perfect Nobody wants to see it. We don't want to acknowledge it. It doesn't belong and it's not okay. Mm -hmm. And so how could we as leaders tell others, no, you don't have to be perfect. No, you don't have to do this. No, you don't have to do that. But I'm going to hide my imperfection. Mm -hmm. what, what are we telling people? If you want to get to the top, you have to pretend to be perfect. And what a horrible role model that would be set or for for our standard set for everybody else. So I want to acknowledge you and thank you for being transparent and for sharing that little insecurity with us here. And I'm so glad to, that you didn't even hold back from being on the show overall, much less from saying, Laura, I'll do it, but not the YouTube video. That one you can't have. <laughs> we'll, we'll do the Apple version, but 
not not some other versions. Oh no, only the audio versions. Uh, so thank you for for sharing that story and that journey. And thank goodness you're okay. That's thank of you. course yes. the most important thing. My podcast is a far distant second from that, but I'm glad that uh, <laughs> it's amazing that you were able to walk out so fully healed so shortly thereafter. Amazing modern medicine. Thank God. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Now, what a, was there a time on the flip side where you needed to assert yourself powerfully? Um, yes. You know, I would think, I think a good example that comes to my mind is when it was very early in my career, uh, I worked for a, I'm not going to use names, but I'll just describe, I worked for a national organization in the technology space. Okay. And at that point uh, in time, it was during a recession and uh, this very large company was struggling financially. And the CEO called me into his office on December 20th. That date is important mm -hmm. because he then declared he expected that I would get on a plane, fly out to our largest facility out in the Midwest, and lay off 200 employees on December 24th. Oh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Here's a <laughs> giant lump of coal in your stocking. Feel free to beat yourself over the head with it. That's so oh, I Well, here, what's funny is I think part of it was that I was so early in my career and naivete took over and I just spoke up. I said, no way, I'm not doing that. I just, I just refused. I said that you cannot do that. You cannot lay off 200 people on December 24th. I, I, what are we screwed to? Like, this is terrible. Like, no. And I said, I'll do it on January 2nd, but I will not do it on December 24th. I went on to try to persuade him. I said, mm. you know, these dedicated employees did nothing wrong, right? This is not their fault. Why do we have to ruin their holiday? It's not going to save the money, the company, any money to wait another two weeks and do it on January 2nd. I'll do it then, but I will not do it on December 24th. He didn't react well, as you might imagine. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of said, get out and uh, told me that he was going to talk to my boss. So I immediately ran downstairs to my boss's office and told her what I just all transferred. <laughs> and uh, and she supported me. She had my back. She stood her ground and she supported me, which kudos to her as a great leader. And she is obviously a good role model for me. Right. And she said, She'll get on that plane on December or on January 2nd and she'll do it. And but not beforehand. And he was not pleased with either one of us. But January 2nd, I was on the plane and I went and I did what I needed to do. And frankly, I wrote my resume on the plane ride home and started my job search immediately. <laughs> and it but apparently has not hurt your career. It has not. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what was really profound was me for me was that I learned very early in my career that my integrity and my moral value system was more important to me than any job. And that I just could not work for a person in a leadership position. And I say that very intentionally, a person in a leadership position. He was not a leader, in my opinion. Mm. And um, because he didn't live up to the moral standards I set for myself. And I'm not going to work for somebody who I can't respect. Yep. And I'm so glad that you drew that distinction because I've often said that leadership by itself is really just an image. I mean, nobody's business card, not that anybody carries business cards anymore, but nobody's official title, you know, says leader on it. It may say vice president or CEO or something along those lines, but really that just makes you the boss because you outrank somebody on the org chart. Leadership is an image and people will perceive you as their leader or they won't. And they will then behave accordingly in the way that they show up for you, for their job, for their company, for everything else. So, uh, you know, kudos for you for distinguishing this is a person in a leadership role, not that he is a leader in the truest sense. So I love that distinction. That's fabulous. And I think this is a good opportunity to now challenge our listeners, Mary Ellen. So I am going to invite you to talk directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. What would you like our listener 24-hour influence challenge to be this week? Well, I am a huge book lover. And okay. as a person who loves to study leadership, most of the successful leaders' biographies that I've read, they consistently point to one of the keys to their success as the practice of reading books. So, my challenge to you is in the next 24 hours, identify a book 
It could be one that you've always wanted to read or been meaning to read. It could be one that's sitting on your nightstand that you bought and you just never opened it up. The challenge is this, open it up, pick up the book and read one chapter in the next 24 hours. Love it. Love it. And you know what? You can buy the Kindle version or yes. ebook or audible version. It doesn't have to be just paperback and sitting on the nightstand. Uh, and at the very least, go and order it. So if exactly. it doesn't, or the, the first 24 hours perhaps could be just placing the order. It shows up <laughs> when it shows up. And then you got 24 more hours. I will give you an extended extra credit, 24 hours extended deadline from the professor here for uh, if it takes a while to arrive, you can have then 24 hours upon opening the Amazon package to read that first <laughs> chapter. So is that okay, Mary Ellen, Dr. I professor love Harris, may Absolutely. I have an extension on my deadline for my assignment? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Love it. Love it. So find that book, whatever it is, get through that first chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, at the very least, place that order. Now, mm -hmm. what is the most nervous you ever felt before a presentation or a speaking engagement? And what communication related lessons did you learn from it? Oh, yes. Oh, well, I can think of a very recent example Ooh. in the spring. Okay. I was very honored I was asked to speak at a women's conference of female, successful female entrepreneurs. And the topic that they asked me to speak on was diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Mm -hmm. And the, so the audience was, they told me, would be about 250 successful women, mm -hmm. uh, business owners, and immediately imposter syndrome kicked in. Mm. Uh, I thought I am not worthy. I Why? am not worthy to speak as an authority on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So my nerves really flared up. I did not want to embarrass my company. I didn't want to embarrass myself. I didn't want to do anything that would reflect poorly on my company or myself. And at the same time, I knew it would be a great professional opportunity for myself. So I pushed myself, took that deep breath, and I said yes, <laughs> and immediately said, all right, I got to figure out how I'm going to best prepare for this. How am sure. I going to make sure that I come across appropriately and professionally? So the most important thing I learned was I found a trusted colleague to be brutally honest with me during my practice sessions. Mm. And she was great. <laughs> You did not hold back. <laughs> she followed and instructions. Okay, that's a good friend. She followed instructions. And I, and that's why I chose her. I knew that this woman would be the best person I could choose to help me prepare for this. And she did a great job. And it definitely made a difference in, in, in terms of my presentation as well as, as well as boosting my confidence. Just the ability to have a sounding board. And mm -hmm. I presume she was somebody who didn't look like you, who wasn't just in a, uh, somebody who would be more appropriate for the target demographic and be able to give you that difference of perspective. Correct. Which of course makes it a little scarier in some ways because there's a greater chance that they're going to find <laughs> stuff to fix along the way. Yep. But the so other important. thing I did that was really, really, I think a game changer for me was that I called the venue where mm. the conference was to be held. Okay. And I asked them, I said, look, can I possibly get access to the space, the stage, the room prior to the day? And they were wonderful. They absolutely allowed, they let me come in two different days. Wow. The week preceding the presentation. And I took my colleague with me. And so I got to do the dry run in the real setting. That's awesome. That gave me an immense amount of comfort. I was comfortable with the state, like where everything was, where the audience would be sitting, where I would be standing, the whole, the, the technology, I got to do the dry run two days, two different days, which was great. And um, that really built my confidence a lot. Sure. And then, it does make a difference to be rehearsing in your office, to be rehearsing in a conference room yes. versus on stage, getting used to the magnitude of the room, getting used to the equipment. Are you wearing a headset with a microphone? Is it a handheld microphone? Are you at a podium? Are the lights in your face? Is there a confidence monitor? Just all the things 
that you never think about. Mm -hmm. If you can do a dry run in the space, the room may or may not be set up as it will be for the event itself, but just to get used to the feeling, the size of the stage, mm -hmm. uh, where you have to turn around to see what you're looking at it on the screen, et cetera, just try it. Oh my gosh, the, the thousand unknown unknowns, all the things that you never would have thought to ask about or prepare for, you end up with this massive list of, okay, note to self, fix this, check that, don't do this, preset that, all these little details. And oh my gosh, what a difference it makes for the confidence knowing that you've already unmasked all of these little gremlins along the way, way before you get there. So how smart is that? And people can ask for that. It was, it was amazing. And I, it just occurred to me, like, I don't even know why I thought of it. It just occurred. I'm like, what if I just call them and ask them? And and they said, yes, it was great. And the other thing I, I will say that I did, which I think also, and I'm, I'm going to continue to do that going forward was during my actual presentation, I confessed that I'm not an expert. I confess that I'm a student of this topic as well. And that I am passionate about learning about it. I'm passionate about trying every day to be better and be a more inclusive and be a more aware leader. And it enabled me to garner some camaraderie, if you will, with the audience, because they were like, oh, thank God. Um, I'm not the only one who doesn't know everything. And they felt this connection. And and so that, I think, was another thing was, I mean, it's another example of vulnerability, right? Just showing that I don't consider myself an expert, but I consider myself a student and I'm learning, and this is what I've learned so far, and acknowledging that I'm going to make mistakes along the way, but I'm still going to try to do better every day. And I felt like that really built a rapport with the audience that, um, again, made me seem more real and sure. approachable. And now tell me, Mary Ellen, if, if you would agree, if I'm interpreting this right, but I would think that on in that situation, there's a very fine line to walk if, with being humble and acknowledging that you don't know everything, that really nobody in many ways knows everything. And there's always uh, stuff to improve on, stuff to learn, ways to improve without doing it in a way that is so self-effacing that it undermines your authority and makes people say, well, then what are you doing on the stage? Right. But it's somebody up there who knows what they're talking about. Why am I going to listen to you? Why'd you get picked when there's so many other authorities out there? Right. Then, you know, that can undermine your your success before you even start with your first point to share. Because we do have, you, if you didn't have value to share, there's no way you would have been invited to speak on that stage Absolutely. in that topic. Yeah. So yeah. what what's what one piece of advice would you give somebody about how to walk that line? So I think what was important was to balance it and immediately have really important points to make and examples of success of how I was able in this, in this concept, in this, or excuse me, on this topic to talk about, this is what we've done. This is what has worked. This is what has not worked. And here's what we've learned from that. So, so giving those cathartic moments or those cathartic examples of success that we we had gained through our DEI and B efforts and, and, and how we took a focused, methodical, strategic approach to it was important to show that I did have some expertise in the topic. Yes. Yeah. At, at the same time, just saying, I don't know everything, but here's what I do know. Yes. Yes. And really that's that's, I think, all we can ask for in, in a situation like that. So kudos to you for finding that line. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I would love to continue it, but unfortunately, we are out of time. So let me thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us on the show today. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. I've enjoyed it very much. Now, how can people learn more about you and Kreischer Miller? I think the best place to go is to our website. And it's very simple. It's www.kmco.com. And of course, we'll put that in the uh, in the show notes as well. So you can find Mary Ellen there and of course, learn more about the company. So, and to everybody else out there, thank you for tuning in. As always, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And of course, don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And of course, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sicola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. 
Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sacola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.